Hi everyone. Uh, today uh, we will start our last chapter of uh, this course, which is basically uh, about partial differential equations, and we will give you a basically a taste of partial differential equations. We will, I mean, it's a different uh, theory. Uh, we will focus on just uh, one equation, and we may just give you. Uh, summary for the other ones too, but uh, in this chapter I will not uh, go in the usual order like 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. I will start from back, uh, so I will start from the heat equation and then after that uh, when we get stuck we will try to build the theory which will be necessary to solve these uh, equations. Actually in this uh, chapter you will see another uh, uh, transform like we did in the Laplace case. Okay, so heat equation on a rod. So rod, you can think like it's like a stick, and we want to understand how heat distributes, and how heat changes on such an object. So uh, basically, our problem is the following. So you have a rod, or a stick, you can think, like this, and we want to understand the heat distribution or the temperature distribution over this. But we will always think the following way. So you think like a wire, and uh, for the cross section here, uh, on the cross section, we will think the temperature is always uh, safe. So it will not depend on the position. So like if you look at the cross section here, so anywhere here, the temperature will be same. So that's the reason we will think the object not like, I mean, three dimensional. So we will just think the object as one dimensional. And so, and if I know this position here and over this cross section, it will be same. So now I want to understand how heat changes or the temperature changes on this thing. But of course, I mean, so here uh, I will use the variable x for the position here over which uh, you have a cross section where the temperature is always same. And so, and now, also, this uh, temperature will, of course, change depending on the time because depending on the environment, so it may uh, cool or it may, I mean, its temperature may increase. You can think that way. So that's the reason. Now, if you look at the uh, temperature over this uh, rod, so if you say, like, I will use the function u, uh, which will give me the temperature, temperature over this. So this will depend on the position because you will not, um, uh, you may have or you may not uh, the same temperature, the same temperature everywhere. So it will depend on the position. And also, th it, this may uh, change through the time, so it will depend on the time too. So then we will use the function, which will have basically, it will depend on the position. And this is the time. So this u function is the temperature at x t. So at position x at time t, you can consider this. As you can see, now, if for this problem, it depends on two variables. X is the position, so over where you are on the rod, because we said through the cross-section, we think the temperature is same. If it weren't same, of course, I mean, this X uh, will depend, so your position will depend on three variables. But in our case, just we are taking X because through the cross-section, the uh, temperature is constant. But, of course, I mean, you can uh, generalize to uh, bigger dimensions. So, this is the temperature of the object or rod at the position x at time t. And now, we will think like the object, not an infinite length, a finite length. So, then we can just put, so we can say that this is the beginning of the object, so we just use the coordinate like x is equal to zero for this, and this is the end of the object, and L, 
let's say it has finite length L. So then, now I want to understand this uh, temperature function. So then if you look at here, how does X change? So here, uh, for this thing, X will change between 0 and L and time, if you say it starts from somewhere with an initial time, so it will start from zero and it will continue forever. So I want to understand this problem. So what is the problem? The temperature of this rod at any position at time t. So if you, let's say, we know the function, we know u, of course it's a function of two variables for this case, so it, if you try to graph it, its graph will be a surface. So what we will have, basically, if you try to graph it, so let's say this is your uh, x, and this is your t, and this is the u. So here, x is between 0 and L, and time is from 0 to infinity. Basically, our function's domain is here. So this is the domain of the function. So what then u will be, the u function will be a surface. Its, it's graph will be a surface over this domain. So you can think like its graph will be something like this. So it will be a surface. Okay. So the result will be an L surface. So if you remember for, uh, for the ODEs, basically we get a, a function of one variable, so it will, its graph was a curve. But here, the solution will be a surface. Now let's go back to the uh, heat problem. So of course, I mean, uh, we have the heat equation. I will not get in details of how to drive this thing. If you want, you can read uh, that there are lots of sources. So basically, I mean, the heat, equ heat equation is the following. It says that the change of the temperature with respect to time is equal to a constant, which is positive, so I'm using alpha square for it, times uxx. So the second derivative of the position to, uh, times a constant is equal to the change uh, with respect to time. So you, uh, you want to understand how uh, the ch change with respect to time is related to change in x, it's given by this equation. So it's this is called heat equation. Heat equation. So here, uh, there is this constant. This constant, of course, depends on the uh, material of the object. So so this is called thermal diffusivity constant. Thermal constant. So I think you can think like if you are thinking a wire, uh, so it may be a copper, it may be another metal. And so depending on that, this constant will change. So we have this heat equation and we will try to solve this. So which basically this equation tells you how the heat, uh, the temperature changes over this object. And uh, if your uh, object wasn't one dimensional like in our case, then of course, I mean, this part will be, uh, if you take the parentheses, then it will have the other variable. So if you had like a, um, two-dimensional object, then you will have uxx plus uyy on this side. And uh, this uh, is a, a partial differential equation. Why? Because our function uh, is a function of two variables. And if you look at my equation, I'm taking the derivative, but these derivatives are not ordinary derivatives anymore. These are partial derivatives. So this is an equation involving an unknown function with derivatives, so which are partial derivatives. So it becomes a partial differential equation. So uh, this is actually, I mean, among uh, this is a linear equation, so I will not get into the de details, but it's a linear equation. 
uh, it's a second order equation because as you see like the highest derivative here is the second derivative and actually I mean there is a classification of these uh, linear case uh, so when you are given a linear PDE like this second order then you can classify it as like um, parabolic type which is the heat equation is an example of this and uh, hyperbolic type with the wave equation so let me just maybe write it uh, uxx minus uyy let me just write uh, the homogeneous case so this is like the wave equation equation and uh, finally the elliptic case and we have the, the homogeneous so problem like this this is called potential equation or Laplace equation Laplace equation it's the same guy Laplace so, but the, the name is uh, Laplace equation if you write uh, there so but mainly I mean we will focus on this thing similarly I mean uh, if you look at the uh, the solution of the heat equation in the upcoming lectures you can apply the same method to solve the others not of course every possible case but uh, so the homogeneous case with some restrictions can be solved also okay now let's go back to the heat equation so we want to solve this heat equation so let's go back to this problem so our equation is the following so I want to solve u sub t alpha square u sub x x so under which condition so this equation with with over this domain over this domain and over this domain I want to solve okay but of course I mean uh, this solution will uh, depend on your initial temperature maybe your initial temperature is so high it will cool down or maybe it was so low you may heat it up so it will its uh, temperature will increase it depends so there must be some initial data so the initial temperature must be known also uh, depending on what you do like maybe uh, yes you put in an environment maybe it's so cool or it's so hot so so th then the problem will change and so now we will look at a certain problem uh, not all the problems so we will think the following problem as a beginning case so we will think we know the initial temperature so in this in this problem now I know the initial temperature okay so at position X so let me just go with the same order so at position X uh, at time 0 I know the initial so it will be just a function of one variable so let's say this is f of X this is what I know uh, furthermore I should know what, what's going to happen after this and I will think the problem in the following way so the temperature will be only affected for this from the ends from the ends and so from the ends so I will think that for the ends the temperature is always zero so for both ends have the temperature zero okay let me just rewrite x changes between zero and L and time is starting from zero so what does this thing say I want to solve this equation heat equation is a partial differential equation and I know the initial temperature distribution over the rod or piece of stick uh, you can think and I know the initial temperature distribution furthermore furthermore and I know that always the end has the temperature zero so you can think like I take a piece of wire and I put them put the ends to the to an ice box okay, so and I want to understand how the heat or the temperature will change over this rod or piece of stick so we want to understand this problem now and we want to solve this problem so uh, basically I mean uh, 
the solution, solution will be, as I said, a surface. And, and if you look at now this problem, you can think like uh, the problem in the following way, in the following way. Uh, so if you go back to the problem, so uh, we have an initial condition. Okay. And also we have this. And so these are like the ends, these are the boundaries of the uh, of the object, okay, of the rod. So these are the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. So I have some I have an initial condition and I have boundary conditions for this problem. So we can think like it's an initial value problem plus a boundary value problem. Okay. So but actually, what is given if you look at here, I'm just drawing the domain. So this is x, this is t. So, so this is l, this is 0. So x, the position that changes between 0 and L, and time is from 0 to infinity. So over this domain, I'm trying to solve the problem. So basically, I will find the surface which will be over this domain and which will satisfy these conditions, initial condition and boundary conditions. But if you look at the conditions, if you, if you look at just the boundary here, this boundary, of this domain. Here, if you take a point, it's if you take a point, it will have coordinate L and T. Okay. Uh, but with this one, maybe you may think like it's misleading. So I wrote this way, but just uh, let me just maybe correct it a little bit for you. So there should be another variable here, but I just meant the following. Okay. So for every time the temperature at the ends is zero. So if you take here a point over this boundary, it has posi it has coordinates L T, and actually from this condition, I know the value there. So ULT is zero, which means that for the solution surface, actually, you know what's happening over this piece. So you know that the function is zero over this piece. Similarly, if you take a point here, then its position, um, its position will be always zero. So you will have and zero, and time will, t will be different over this line. But if you take u of it, again, from the boundary condition, this will be zero, which says that over this line and over this line, I know the values for u, because here and here, I know the values. Now, if you take a point here, its position will be x, and but its time will be zero. So if you look at, it will be x is zero. So from the initial condition, I know what this thing is. This is f of x. So basically what this thing says, yes, you are looking for a surface, but the boundary of the surface is already determined because over this line, over this line, and over this line, I know the solution. So basically you can think this problem initial value plus boundary value, but actually altogether, if you look at, if you look at, it's a boundary value problem for, a, for the following domain. For this domain, I'm telling you what's happening over the boundary, and then I just want you to fill inside according to the differential equation given. 
So basically, I told you the end of the surface, so I know what's happening for the boundary, but I just want you to fill inside by using the equation. So altogether now it's a boundary value problem basically. Okay, now we will try to find a solution. Now let's look for some trivial solution, so which may satisfy this. So, so how about solutions? Okay, so we know what's happening inside on the boundary because the boundary is completely zero. So if you look at, if I take the following function u x t equal to zero, which is zero everywhere, so it's clearly it's clearly a solution because if you look at derivative of zero with respect to t is zero, derivative of zero with respect to x twice is zero, zero is equal to zero. It satisfies. So it's a solution to heat equation. It's a solution to heat equation. But is it a solution to our problem? Uh, if I plug in x uh, in the place of x, if I plug in L, it satisfies. If I plug in zero, it satisfies. The only thing is, if I plug in x zero, here it is zero. But if my initial temperature is not zero, then this will not satisfy my boundary value problem. So this is a solution to heat equation. And it's the solution to our problem if the initial temperature were also zero. And it is the solution, the solution to our boundary value problem. So let me just write this way, BVP, so boundary value problem. It's, and it's the solution to our boundary value problem if the initial temperature is zero. So if f of x were zero, it's the solution. So in that case, we know the solution. But if this f of x, if the initial temperature is not zero, of course, I mean, this won't be a solution to your problem anymore. It's just, I mean, uh, so, so it won't be a solution you are looking for. So typically, I mean, you will somehow initial, con uh, you will have some initial temperature other than zero. So then what are we going to do in this case? So now we need to look for solutions for that case now, which will eventually give us some beautiful theory. Okay. Now, in the general case, how are we going to solve it? So, so at this point, now, you can think like this is a trial and error, so uh, business. So we will try a method, uh, and eventually we will see that it will work. So what is that method? Now, if you look at the problem, uh, there are two things, I mean, as your variable, position and time. So you may think like, I mean, so they are not depending on each other. So you may assume that they are separate. So then we do the following assumption. So assume now, assume, assume you Actually, here, x and t are separate, which means, so, this function, solution I'm looking for, actually is product of two functions. You can say, how did you come up with this idea? Again, yeah, I mean, I'm just assuming this. If I can get a solution out of this, it will be great. So, this is, again, trial thing. And 
And for this kind of equations, like the ones I mentioned, like the Laplace equation, uh, potential equation, wave equation, heat equation, actually, you will see that, I mean, it works. Uh, not always, and of course, I mean, there are some technical conditions, and in our cases, those technical conditions are already satisfied. We will not worry about those too much. Okay, now, this is my assumption. I'm assuming that uh, I can write the solution this way. This is called separation of variables. So how do I think like, I mean, they are, they are separate things, so there, there is no relation between them. One is position, the other is time. So I'm thinking like my solution looks like this. So separation of variables. I'm going to use this assumption. And then if we, would, if we start with this assumption then, how is now our equation? So if you look at, we had u sub t. A u sub t means taking the derivative of this with respect to t, but there's only t here, and this capital T depends on t, just t. So taking the derivative of this means just the ordinary derivative. So we have x of x times t prime t. That's u t. So this must be equal to alpha square u sub xx. So what is this? This is alpha square. I'm going to take the derivative of this part with respect to x, but there's only x in the first function. So that means I will just take the derivative of this thing, but two derivatives I have to take, so it will be second derivative. Again, it will be ordinary derivative to what we have. Okay, so from here now, what do we get? We get the following equation. And now, after this, I can group them the x part and the t part, okay? So then what do we get? So if you look at, if I divide this thing, if I divide this thing by x, so I will get the following. And divide this part with alpha square p over t, everything basically, or uh, like the cross multiplication. So you could take, Take this t of t alpha square under this. Take x of x under this. So we have the following. So if you do the cross multiplication, this times this, this times this, they are equal to each other. So I got this. So I separated them. So now we have two ratios. One depends on x. The other depends on t. So what can we say about this ratio? So think about like I mean, if they are equal to each other, if I change t, this part will change. But since I'm fixing x, that this part won't change. So if you want to get equality, then whatever I do for t, this ratio must be constant. Otherwise, they won't be equal. Similarly, you can do the same thing for x. If I change this x, if I play with x, this ratio will change, but since I'm not changing t, so this part will be same. So that means it must be constant. So they are going to be same, so they must be just a constant here. So I will write this constant as lambda, or minus lambda. And so let me just write minus. It doesn't matter which one you use. Minus lambda plus lambda. So then they must be constant. So from here, what do I get? So, actually, from this thing, you can write the following two equations. So, if you do just focus on the x part minus lambda and t part minus lambda, we get the following equation. First equation is x double prime plus lambda times x is equal to zero. So just this, x, this, take to the other side. Second, we will have e prime plus lambda times alpha square times t equal to zero. 
So if you look at, if you think alpha lambda is a constant, now here, actually now we have two ordinary differential equations. One is second order, the other is first order. And then if you think lambda, here it's constant, and these are nice equations because second order, constant coefficient, first order, constant coefficient, both of them are homogeneous. And by using the characteristic polynomial idea, we can solve them. But now, if you remember our problem, yes, now I use separation of variables to separate basically things. And out of this, from a PDE, I got two ODE, which are well known. But how about the boundary conditions? So if you look at the boundary conditions, we had the following. We had, we had the following. We had zero t, this must be zero. So one and temperature is always zero, whatever the time is. But if you rewrite this, this is x zero t of t. So this product must be zero. And so if this product is zero, either this is zero or this is zero. If t of t is zero, then u is zero because u was, so if t of t is zero, you get completely zero, which is a trivial solution, like the, well, the one we started with. So, but I, I want to get something else. So I already know that zero is a solution to the heat equation. It's the con it's constant solution. And uh, so it's trivial actually. So I'm looking for something more. So, so if I use this zero, I will get trivial solution. So that means that if I want to get something non-trivial, then this must be zero. So this implies you should take this condition, x of zero is zero. Again, this could be zero, but that gives you a trivial solution, which is u is completely zero. And similarly, the other thing says u l t, it must be zero, so which is saying x of l t of t. Similarly, this will imply x of l must be zero. Okay. So these are the boundary conditions we got. Okay. And finally, how about the initial condition or the other boundary condition? So we have f of x, and that is u x zero, which says that, and which says that we have x of x times t of zero is equal to f of x. This, this is this may be non-zero, so I cannot say anything further. But at least I got the following thing: x zero and x l must be zero for non-trivial solutions. So for the first problem, I have these boundary conditions. So I have basically a boundary value problem for the first one. And second one, we will do something. But uh, at least, I mean, I have the following conditions for x. So what I could do now, I can either start from this one and then get some solution and then try to satisfy this, or vice versa. But since I have already these good conditions, zero, homogeneous conditions, I want to start with this because I will not be able to reach anything because I don't have any data here yet. Or if you think this one, but f of x is general function, you might get something nice out of that one. Okay, now what I will do, first of all, I will try to solve this. So for which lambdas this is going to be true? And then after this, for those lambdas, I will try to satisfy the second one and eventually this condition. Okay. So, let's look at our equation, x double prime lambda x equal to zero with the conditions. Zero. So I'm trying to solve boundary value problem. Why boundary? Because over the boundary 
I'm given the condition. So you are thinking like here, this is your domain for x. So x is between 0 and L. And you want to solve this differential equation. And for the ends, data is given. Or for the ends, you know the values. So for the boundaries, the conditions are given. So it's a boundary value problem. Remember, for the uh, IVPs, at a specific point, we were given the function values, depending on the order, and some of its derivatives. But here, on the boundary, URL, we are given the conditions. OK, now what are we going to do? Of course, we have to do, we don't know anything about lambda yet, so we have to do case by case. Lambda, constant, what it can be? It can be negative, it can be positive, it can be zero. OK, let's say it is negative. So, first case, lambda is negative. So, now if you look at the characteristic polynomial, here, characteristic polynomial is always r squared plus lambda. Okay? If you take it equal to zero, now be careful, lambda is now negative. So, this gives us r is equal to minus lambda in square root plus or minus. So if you take to the other side, take the square root because minus lambda is now positive. So we have these things. So then what do we get for the solution? x of x, c1, e to the minus, let's take the plus 1, x, c2, e to the minus square root of minus lambda times x. Okay, so this is the solution. Now let's check the boundary conditions. So x of 0 must be 0. So if you plug in 0 here, we get e to the 0 is 1, e to the 0 is 1. So we have c1 plus c2. Now, second thing, x of l, this must be 0. So if you plug in now l, we have the following, e to the uh, minus e to, e to the square root of negative lambda times L times C1 plus e to the minus square root of minus lambda times L C2. So we have the following system. If you write in the matrix form, we are trying to solve an homogeneous equation, and our coefficients are 1, 1 for the first equation, and e to the square root of negative lambda times L, and e to the negative square root of negative lambda times L. So this is what we have. And we know that for homogeneous, either you have a unique solution, or you have infinite domain solution. It's all about the determinant of this. If you look at the determinant of this one, since these two things are not same, not same, only same, I mean, if lambda is zero, if you are assuming lambda is negative. So since they are not same, determinant won't be zero. So since determinant is not zero, we will have a unique solution which says C1 and C2 is zero. So this gives us C1, C2, R, both zero. But if c1, c2 are zero, so we get the x of x equal to zero, which is again trivial solution. So we get so x of x equal to zero, a trivial solution. We didn't get anything out of this. Now let's look at the second case. Second case. Now, about lambda is equal to uh, zero. In this case, our roots are going to be zero. So 
r is going to be 0, but we will have a double root. So let me just write twice. So then what will be the solution? Solution will be x of x is equal to c1 times 1, which is e to the 0 x, c2 times x times e to the 0 x, which is c1 plus c2 x. So now if you look at the conditions, x of 0 is 0, which says that now c1 is 0, x of l must be 0. If you plug in, we have c1 plus c2 times l. So c1 is 0, c2 times l is 0, which says that c2 is 0. So again, this implies both of them are 0, which again says your solution is the 0 solution, which gives us the trivial solution. So we didn't get anything out of this. So there's only one final candidate left. So we, have, we are going to try that one. So there is only one hope right now. That is the case when lambda is positive. Okay. Lambda is positive. Oh, I will be lazy now. Oh, lambda is positive. In this case, if you look at the solutions, if now lambda is positive, we will get now, minus lambda, which is going to be negative. So if you take a square root, we will get complex numbers. What are those complex numbers? Plus and minus square root of lambda i. This is what we are going to get. So our solution then will be c1 cosine square root of lambda x plus c2 sine square root of lambda x pure imaginary, no real part, so no exponential. So now if you look at, when I plug in 0, I must get 0. If I plug in 0 here, cosine 0 is 1. So I have c1. But sine 0 is 0. So that's it. So it says that c1 is 0. So we were expecting maybe, uh, again, we will have a zero solution. But there's only one final thing left, one final hope. So if I plug in L, I must get zero. If I plug in L here, let me just write, okay, I know C1 is zero, but cosine square root of lambda times L plus C2 sine F. What we get. Now I know this part is zero because C1 is zero. Okay, so then this thing must be zero, this part. And there are two ways for this thing to zero. Either C2 is zero, C1 over over the zero, C2 is zero, I get the trivial solution, nothing comes out of it. But also I could have this thing zero. Sign square root of lambda L, which is another possibility. In that case, C2 can be anything, because this is already 0. And so now I can find some non-trivial solutions. When does it happen? It happens when this part is 0. So, so now, now, for this part, so I could have the final, the following thing. So I can have L zero. So when is sine function zero? So at integer multiples of pi, you will have zero. So this is if and only if square root of lambda times L is equal to 
equal to n times pi. So L is positive. This is positive, so n must be positive here. But if you look at actually what does this thing say? This thing says lambda is equal to divide by L takes square. So n pi over L square. So whenever you have this, whenever you have this, then you have the solution. So whenever this is zero, you have the solution. So how many solutions do I have? Tons of solutions. For every n, I have a solution. So sine sine square root of lambda and pi over L times x, this is a solution. And this is a solution for every x. So for every n, sorry. So I can say these are, depending on n, are solutions to my problem. So for n, these are solutions to my problem. Not only these, not only these. Of course, any multiple of these things are solutions too. So you can write here, if you want, if you want, and cn times, cn times, cn times, this is also a solution, okay? But remember, these are solutions. Any multiple of them are solutions. Why? Because we have a homogeneous equation. Homogeneous boundary conditions, we have a homogeneous equation. So not only these, not only these, also, also their linear combination for every n is a solution too. So I can write here Cn, and they also sum is a solution too. Okay, now keep this in mind. These are solutions, they are linear combinations, solutions too. Okay, so now what we did, we solved the first ODE. So, and now we have a second one. How about the second one, T? What happened to T? So now remember T, we had T prime plus lambda alpha square times T is equal to zero. Now I know lambda. Lambda is this. So, if you write this, you write this, T prime, I mean, you can do as a constant coefficient way. So, minus, uh, and pi over L square times alpha square T. But be careful now, for every N, I will get a T. And for that N only, I will get that corresponding T. So for every lambda, there is a corresponding X. It means for every N, there is a corresponding X. And for that lambda, there is a corresponding T. So this is what we have. If you solve this, I'm looking for a function whose derivative is equal to this multiple times itself. Of course, this should be an exponential function. So this is going to be e to do, e to do, e to do, this, minus n pi, n square, pi square over L square times alpha square t. But be careful, this thing depends on n. So for every n here, you have the following solution. So now how about you now? 
So you So let me write the following way, maybe. So for lambda n over pi, uh, okay, L square, where n is from 1 two, three, so it goes like this. Then for this, I have xn sine n, sine uh, n pi over x. For the same lambda, for the same lambda, I have tn, which is e to the minus n square pi square over L square square T. Now, this is xn, this is tn. So when you multiply them, you get u. So together, they give you, they give you uh, sine n, sine n pi L x times e to the minus n square pi square over l square alpha square t. So this product gives you u. But that u depends on, that u depends on n2. Okay, so this u will depend on n2. So this is a solution. This is a solution. But not only these, also any combination of these things is a solution too. So what do we get out of this? Basically, if I take their linear combination, if I take Cn times Un, then their linear combination and change from 1 to infinity, if you take this infinite sum, this is going to be a solution too. So this is going to be your full solutions. Now, if you write here n equal to 0, actually, u0 is 0. That's your trivial solution. So then we get the following. Solution. Let me just write this way. E to the minus n square pi square l square alpha square t sine n pi l x. This is what we got now here. So why do we have this thing? And why their sum is a solution? Because again, homogeneous. We have homogeneous problem, that's the reason not only these, their linear combinations are also solutions. So we get this as the general solution, you think. That's what we have. Now, until now, until now, we only satisfied the boundary over the edges. Now, how about the initial condition? How about that one? So that's left. So, sorry, I forgot CN here. So think about, like, I mean, we wrote the general solution like the ones we did uh, for all these, and we had some uh, unknown coefficients, c1, c2, c3, whatever. Here we have infinite limited coefficients. Now we want to determine this. How we were determining that? We were using the initial condition. So now I will use the initial condition to determine these cn's. So what does the initial condition say? u x 0 must be equal to f of x. And so this is going to be, if you plug in time 0, you plug in time 0, 
here, then e to the 0 is 1, you just get sine. So we have Cn sine and pi Lx. So f of x this, and then I will get Cn. What does this thing say? What are Cn? If you want to find Cn's, then express your initial temperature function in terms of sine. So write them in terms of sine, and the corresponding coefficients will be your Cn's. Now, what does this thing say? I need to express, I need to write my solution in terms of sine functions so that this sum will be equal to that one. What does this mean? Is it true for any given function? For example, can I write any given function in terms of a uh, sum of sine functions, maybe cosine functions? So what is special about these? And like I knew that for smooth functions, uh, I could express them as a Taylor series. But the problem is whether Taylor series converts to the function. And so here, for which functions I can write this thing? And if I can, let's say I can write it, then what can I say about the coefficients? How am I going to calculate these coefficients? So that's our, these are some questions we need to answer. And we will answer them next time. So next time, I mean, we will try to answer these things. So because we, we didn't finalize the problem yet. We know the general solution. And this, to find the solution, I need to find Cn's. And this equation tells me you have to write your function as a sum of signs then there should be some coefficients here. Those coefficients must be the coefficients there. So my solution is an infinite, I mean, I have an infinite thing here. And now next time we will build this. For which functions we can express this? Maybe for this problem we got sine, maybe how about cosines maybe? And also we will learn how to, how to find, how to calculate these coefficients. By the way, here, I want to say something about these sine functions now, and then I want to finish today's lecture. Uh, so if you look at here, uh, if you look at this problem, I try to solve this problem, and basically I solve this, the following thing. This. So, you can think like, I mean, uh, for these functions, when you take their second derivative, they are equal to a multiple of itself. So remember uh, the definition of eigen uh, vector. When you multiply with the matrix, it goes to a multiple of itself. Here, if you use a similarity, you are taking the derivatives here, the second derivative, and it is mapped to a multiple of itself. That's the reason, I mean, these things are called eigenfunctions like the eigenvectors, they are mapped to multiple of itself. Here, under the derivative, they are mapped to a multiple of itself. And these are the, and the eigenvalues. So, and so here, xn, those are the solutions, are called eigenfunctions, are called eigenfunctions eigenfunctions. And here lambdas or minus lambdas, when you call lambda, these are called eigenvalues. Okay. Or minus lambda you can say. Okay. So we are using some similarity from the uh, linear algebra. And next time we will start with this problem, how to, how to express the function in terms of sines and cosines. And, but before that, uh, we will start with some um, knowledge about boundary value problems. Because here now I solved, some I solved a boundary value problem. So for this thing, I had the boundary conditions, x0, xl equal to 0. And, we, uh, and I want to show you that actually this is quite different than the initial value problem. Remember, for the initial value problem, under certain conditions, you have a unique solution. But the nature of boundary value problem is a little bit different. Even 
things may seem like smooth, nice, but depending on the boundary conditions, you may have no solution or you may have infinitely many solutions. So their uh, nature is quite different. So I will start with an example where you will see these differences. And then after that, we will try to answer the, this problem. I mean, how to express a function in terms of sines and similarly cosines, if you think. And, <clears throat> and that will basically uh, start the theory of Fourier series. Okay, see you next time.